It is now my great privilege and honor to invite President Jennifer Rabb to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm really very touched. Um, my welcome and thanks to all of you for not only attending the National Center's historic 50th Annual Conference, but really making this successful enterprise pos possible by engaging with us and believing in this incredibly important mission. Um, a special thanks to Karen and Gary and all the members of our board for the leadership, your advice, your commitment. Um, to Anne, to TIA, Kraft, and to all of our sponsors, for, again, for making this possible. As Bill said, this is the last such conference that I will welcome as a Hunter College president. I've done so every year since 2002, and so it is a bittersweet moment for me. Uh, it will, of course, be hard for me to say goodbye to Hunter, an institution I love so dearly and with which I am so highly and so personally identified. But at the same time, I'm filled with pride in having helped the American dream come true for almost the past 22 years for tens of thousands of wonderful, inspiring graduates. That has been the privilege of a lifetime. I'm filled with equal pride for having been a part of this incredibly important National Center's success and impact. As Bill said, I was asked early in my tenure as president to provide a home for the center as it moved from another CUNY institution. It hit me immediately. Given the importance of the mission, it really seemed like a no-brainer. But I must admit, I didn't imagine the actual impact and engagement a fully revitalized center would have on a national scale, and I am truly honored to be a part, in a small way, of its success in its 50th year. Now, the center is more important than ever. We live in a time of such dangerous polarization. We look at this and speak about it all the time. People on opposite sides of political and social issues can't talk, just won't talk to one another. And yet, thanks to the National Center, here we are today with people from what has been historically one of the deepest divides, labor and management, working collaboratively on a host of very relevant and often thorny issues. I really think we should all really take that in. It's so marvelous to see, and I really feel blessed to have played a role in supporting the National Center in this vital role of conversation across the aisles. The center's role exemplifies the Hunter motto, mihi cura futuri, the care of the future is mine. That care, that caring for the future is exactly what drives this impactful center. Hunter has been fortunate to have two extraordinary leaders guiding the center, we all have. I was so fortunate with that when the center moved to Hunter, it was led by the visionary Richard Boris, who worked tirelessly to expand the center's reach and participation in this conference and to expand our publications. He was also a Hunter alum, as was his wife, so I had a particular affection for him. When he left us a decade ago, we weren't sure how to fill such big shoes. Bill Herbert was the clear answer. Building on Richard's legacy and really standing on the shoulders of a giant, Bill has made the center an even more important force in national labor relations. I am particularly gratified that Bill has integrated into the center our faculty and students at Hunter and all in the metropolitan area and across the country. It's really become a hub. And at the moment, he's put together a team of undergraduate researchers from Hunter, from CUNY, from Rutgers to compile a national survey on unionization and higher education. He also teaches labor law and he's at Roosevelt House and he's created new courses in this area. So think about it. In this way, Bill makes sure that the next generation will be committed to the critical labor management issues that bring you all here today and that the seats at the 75th anniversary conference will be again filled with the best and the brightest as they are today at our 50th. So thank you, Bill. We owe you a round of applause. I also want to thank, as Bill has, the incredible Michelle Savarisi. Nothing happens in the center without her. So Michelle, I know you're probably not even out there. You're probably doing something important, but let's give you a round of applause also. Um, and then one of, we have so many wonderful board members, but a special shout out to the wonderful Pam Silverbat, who is retiring from CUNY as Senior Vice Chancellor for Labor Relations. She is a leader in this field, so much wisdom. She's been a guiding force on our board, and we're hoping to keep her involved in this center. But thank you, Pam, for your service. 
The decision to give the National Center a home at Hunter College was driven not only by my belief in its, its mission, but also my recognition that its mission aligns so well with that of Hunter and CUNY's. Hunter was founded more than 150 years ago by a visionary educator, Thomas Hunter. He established Hunter as a free public teacher's college that accepted female applicants of all races, religions, and backgrounds. But truly, it was a revolutionary concept in the year 1870. We were the ninth school in the nation to accept women into, into higher education, and Thomas Hunter actually really created new work opportunities for women at a time when no such path was open to majority of them. There's also a historic bond between the National Center and one of Hunter's crown jewels, Roosevelt House, which is one of the sites of the conference this year. I hope all of you will really get to enjoy and visit the house and take a tour and see the historic rooms. This was the house that Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt used as their New York home until they moved to that other famous house in Washington. Because the inauguration was not until March in the years of the 1930s, Roosevelt was elected in November 1932, he did not leave the house until March, and so that, this was the house in which the New Deal was really created. It was the place where the transition headquarters were located, and all of his advisors came to address the crisis of the Depression. So the New Deal programs that would change America forever were developed in the rooms of Roosevelt House. I think it's fitting as we launch this conference to remember one crucial meeting that took place at Roosevelt House when Roosevelt sat down in the second floor library and asked Frances Perkins to become the first woman cabinet officer in American history, specifically the Secretary of Labor. As you all know, Frances Perkins was one of our nation's most dedicated leaders in revising labor, labor laws, shortening the work week, eliminating child labor, improving safety conditions, and establishing unemployment insurance. She was an unrelenting force for good, and when she looked at Roosevelt, when he made this historic offer to say, would you be the first woman cabinet secretary in American history, she said, only if you, president-elect, will create a social safety net to protect Americans. So it was in this house that Social Security was born through her fierce determination. We are so proud of this, uh, this connection with her, and we see the National Center following in that emotional connection with Hunter and Francis Perkins and making the world a better place through better labor connections and labor laws. So for those of you who haven't visited the house, please go and take a tour and feel that spirit of connection to great um, labor leaders that live on through our center. It is now my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Michael Sandel. This is a great personal pleasure for me since I had the privilege of serving with Michael on the Harvard Law School Dean's Advisory Board and got to know personally his brilliance and his inspiration. But actually, I have the task of introducing two speakers this morning because Michael Sandel is both a professor of political philosophy at Harvard and an international rock star. Seriously, that is exactly how he was described by a Japanese newspaper that said, and I quote, Few philosophers are compared to rock star, but that's the kind of popularity Michael Sandel enjoys in Japan. And Japan is far from the only country where Professor Sandel is a celebrity. He was once named, quote, the most influential foreign figure of the year in China. And when he did a book tour of Chinese universities, students lined up for hours to get seats. In South Korea, they actually scalped tickets for his events. <laughs> Michael's lectures have taken him across five continents and packed venues such as St. Paul's Cathedral in London, the Sydney Opera House in Australia, and the Public Theatre here in New York Central Park. Tens of millions of people around the world have followed his online and televised classes, and his books have been translated into 30 languages. At Harvard, which by the way, we at Hunter like to call that other H school, some 15,000 students have taken his class on justice making it one of the most highly attended courses in the university's history. So great is the impact that the course was turned into a 12-part series for public television, and more recently, Michael's done a TV series for the BBC. Now, as I need to, hardly need to tell anyone here, this is not the normal experience for college professors. So what makes this man so globally famous? One factor is that online education make audience of millions for classes like Professor Sandel's possible. 
But his popularity in East Asia is driven by something else, an intense and widespread desire in that region to get away from rote learning to more creative, thought-provoking, discussion-based education, and that is exactly what Michael Sandel provides. Most relevant of all, Professor Sandel is not only a brilliant teacher, he is a philosopher who examines many of the most gripping issues that face our society today. For example, his most recent book is The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good, in which he contends that the over-embrace of meritocracy has undercut our nation's working class and created a fierce populist backlash. Michael, in thinking about your writing, I just wanted to note that we at Hunter fully agree with your argument that society needs to open educational doors for the children of the working class, which is exactly what we've been doing for 150 years. I have an example from my tenure that I believe specifically proves your point. I always knew that our students could achieve the same postgraduate honors as Ivy League kids if we just had the same resources. So about a decade ago, we recruited one of Harvard's most prestigious fellowship advisors to Hunter and gave him a small budget to work with our students to help them apply for the top post-college fellowships. Well, the semester after he arrived, we had our first Marshall Scholar with another to follow soon after. Then Hunter had its first Rhodes Scholar and a second two years later, one the child of Haitian immigrants and one a DACA student from Nepal. As you write, the potential for achievement is there in the sons and daughters of the working class, and we are proud to have done our small part to prove your point. Michael, there's a wonderful symmetry in having you as our keynote speaker this morning, because your counterpart at the center's first conference half a century ago was another great American philosopher, Sidney Hook. That name will surely resonate with many of you in the audience, for Hook, too, was famous for dealing in public forums with urgent public issues like ethics, political theory, and education. All these issues are very much related to the work that all of you do in your fields. One need only look at the topics of the panel that will be attended at this conference to see the connection to Michael Sandel's work. He makes him the keynote speaker as in an ideal way as we celebrate a half a century of the National Center's achievements. It is a great honor to have Michael Sandel with us this morning, so please join me in giving him a great welcome to both professor and intellectual rock star, Michael Sandel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, uh, President Rab. Jennifer Rab, I want to begin, that was such a generous introduction, I want to begin by saying what an honor it is for me to be here to celebrate your 22 years of remarkable leadership at Hunter College. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's, you leave a remarkable legacy, and it's a legacy that's connected, Jennifer, as you said, to opening access to higher education to the children for, for the working class. And that, it's a powerful legacy, and we need to enlarge it throughout this country. 50 years of this center, and here I want to congratulate Bill Herbert and everyone involved with this center. 1973, Sidney Hook gave the inaugural keynote at this center's conference. It seems a long time ago, doesn't it? 1973. Cast your, man, cast your mind back. Richard Nixon had just been re-elected as president in a landslide. Though a year later, the Watergate scandal would bring him down. 1973, just before this center first convened, the Supreme Court handed down its landmark Roe versus Wade ruling 50 years ago. The Bakke decision about affirmative action was five years in the future. 
1973, we confronted inequality in this society. The average CEO in 1973 made 22 times the pay of the average worker, 22 times. Today, the average CEO makes 390 times the pay of an average worker. In 1973, one in four American workers belonged to a union. Today, it's one in 10. Though, as you know better than I do, in the field of education, it's about one in three. Back when he gave his talk, Sidney Hook was ambivalent about collective bargaining in higher education because he saw it as a potential threat to the academic mission. We must opt for that form of collective bargaining, he said, that will least affect the achievement of our academic mission. He was worried that collective bargaining would negotiate contracts so secure that they would render tenure assessments on the basis of academic excellence obsolete. That worry did not come to pass. And today, when we reflect on the academic mission of higher education, somehow collective bargaining seems, given the changes in higher education, less threatening than Sidney Hook feared. Perhaps the most consequential change over the five decades since this center began it has to do with the widening inequality brought about by the age of globalization. President Rabb mentioned the polarization that we now see throughout our public life. And for decades, this has been building. The divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, setting us apart. This has partly to do with the widening inequalities of income and wealth that this age of market-driven globalization has brought. But it's not only that. I think it has also to do with the changing attitudes toward success that have accompanied the widening inequalities. Those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserve the full measure of the bounty that the market bestows upon them. And by implication, that those who struggle, those left behind, must deserve their fate too. Now, this way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly attractive ideal, the meritocratic ideal, which says, insofar as chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. That's the meritocratic principle. That's the promise. Now, we all know that chances are not truly equal. We don't live up to the meritocratic principles we profess. That's one problem. But there may be a further problem, which is that the ideal itself is flawed. That the ideal can't reach or enable us to contend with the kinds of inequalities we face today. This has a bearing on higher education and the role of higher education. Because in recent decades, the academic mission of higher education has been enlisted 
in some ways transformed by a certain attempt to contend with the inequalities we as our society, as a society, face. But the way higher education has been enlisted to alleviate inequality reflects a flawed ideal, or so I'd like to suggest, a flawed conception of equality, but also a flawed conception that has exerted a corrosive toll on what higher education is for. And simply put, It's transformed, this way of thinking, has transformed higher education into a kind of sorting machine for a market-driven meritocratic society. Let me explain why this is not such a good thing and why it reflects a blinkered, narrow conception of what equality really means. Let me go back to the meritocratic principle I mentioned a moment ago. In some ways, meritocracy was born as a principle of equality, a way of combating the inequalities associated with inherited status, feudal aristocracy, which consigned people to the fate of the accident of their birth. Meritocracy seemed a principle that combats inequality by saying everyone should have an equal opportunity to compete for society's rewards. This way of thinking about how to address inequality is deeply influential. It's inscribed in our politics. You've heard politicians say, everyone should be able to rise as far as their efforts and talent will take them. We hear this from Democrats and Republicans, especially over the last four decades. I call this the rhetoric of rising. In America, everyone can rise as far as their efforts and talents will take them or should be able to do so. The rhetoric of rising has a certain egalitarian ring because it emphasizes removing barriers to achievement. Whatever your family background or class or race or religion or gender or sexual orientation, you too should be able to rise as far as your talents will take you. Who could disagree? But despite its egalitarian bent, the rhetoric of rising has worked to entrench rather than challenge inequalities of income and wealth in recent decades. It did not propose this, the political project associated with the rhetoric of rising, did not propose to reconsider the economic policies that produce these inequalities. Instead, it offered a kind of workaround. It offered individual upward mobility through higher education. So, to workers frustrated by stagnant wages and the outsourcing of jobs to low-wage countries, elites of the 1990s and the 2000s offered some bracing advice. If you want to compete and win in the global economy, Go to college. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. These were the slogans that mainstream politicians, Democrats and Republicans, offered. What they failed to notice was the insult implicit in this advice. The insult was this. If you didn't go to college, and if you're struggling in the new economy, your failure is your fault. 
It's no wonder, then, that many working people turned against meritocratic credentialed elites. Those of us who spend our days in the company of the credentialed can easily forget a simple fact. Most Americans don't have a four-year college degree. Nearly two-thirds do not. So it's folly to create an economy that makes a university diploma a necessary condition of dignified work and a decent life. Elites have so valorized a college degree, both as an avenue for advancement and as a basis for social esteem, that they have difficulty understanding the hubris a meritocracy can generate. And they don't see or feel the harsh judgment it imposes on those who haven't gone to, gone to college. These attitudes, this hubris, fueled the resentment against elites that prompted the backlash that we saw beginning in 2016, most visibly, and that continues to shadow our public life today. If there's something to this, if meritocratic attitudes towards success have deepened the divide between winners and losers, if individual mobility through higher education is too feeble a response to the inequalities of income and wealth we see today, if the rhetoric of rising has become, for many, less a promise than a taunt, what should we do? What is the alternative? We should begin by acknowledging that mobility cannot compensate for inequality. Any serious response to the gap between the rich and the rest must reckon directly with inequalities of power and wealth, not rest content with the project of helping people scramble up a ladder even as the rungs on that ladder grow further and further apart. This means we need to shift the terms of public discourse. Broadly speaking, it means we should focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on the dignity of work. We should be debating in our politics what policies will ensure that Americans who don't inhabit the privileged ranks of the professional classes can find work that enables them to support a family, contribute to their community, and win social recognition for doing so. And part of the solution requires rethinking the role of higher education. Colleges and universities have been conscripted into the political project I've just described. Higher education serves as the arbiter of opportunity. It confers the credentials and defines the merit that a market-driven merit meritocracy rewards. This is what I mean when, when I say that We've converted colleges and universities into sorting machines. And doing so actually entrenches rather than challenges inequality. How so? For a pretty obvious reason. Affluent parents have figured out how to pass their privileges on to their kids, not by bequeathing them vast estates, as in the old days of a hereditary aristocracy, but instead by equipping them to compete in the meritocratic tournament and to win admission to top colleges and universities. SAT scores are closely correlated with family income. So too is access to internships, music lessons, training in sports such as 
squash and lacrosse and sailing and rowing and fencing and golf and water polo. Travel to perform good works in distant places and other activities that burnish college applications. As a result of all of this, at Ivy League and other highly selective universities, despite generous financial aid policies, there are more students from families in the top 1% than there are from families in the bottom half of the country combined. The percent of students on the campuses of the 100 or so most selective colleges and universities, the percent who come from low-income families, the bottom quartile, what would you guess? It's 3%. Most young people from the bottom half of the income scale attend a two-year college or none at all. And even for those who do win admission, higher education is not the engine of upward mobility we take it to be when we consider it the sole or the primary response to inequality. The economist Raj Chetty and a team of colleagues calculated mobility rates at some 1,800 U.S. colleges and universities, public and private, selective and non-selective. And they asked the following question, how many students at these institutions arrived from poor families, low-income families, bottom quintile, and then rose to affluence, top quintile, as adults. What would you guess is the, was the answer? 2%. 2%. Now, this is not because going to college doesn't help with uh, earnings after graduation. It's mainly due to the fact that there are so few students from low-income families at four-year colleges in the first place. Today, higher education is like an elevator in a building that most people enter on the top floor. That's why that figure is so low. Though I hasten to add, at Hunter College, it's a considerably higher figure. Important though it is to broaden access to elite colleges, we also have to lower the stakes of the frenzied competition to get in. And this means we should invest far more than we do in those forms of learning that most people rely on to prepare themselves for the world of work. I'm thinking of state colleges, two-year community colleges, and vocational and technical training. Isabel Sawhill, an economist at Brookings, calculated that we spend about $162 billion a year helping people go to college. But on career and technical training, $1.1 billion. $162 billion to $1.1 billion for, for career and technical training. So this is why it's a mistake to think that an adequate response to inequality, to the inequality of recent decades, is simply to tell people to go get a university diploma and to rise as individuals. Doing so repeatedly as mainstream politicians and political parties have done in recent decades, has not only failed to make much of a dent in inequality, it's also inflicted a more insidious injury. The gradual erosion of the dignity of work. By valorizing the brains it takes to score well on college admissions tests, the, short, the sorting machine disparages those, implicitly disparages those without meritocratic credentials. 
It tells them that the work they do, less valued by the market than the work of well-paid professionals, is a lesser contribution to the common good, and so less worthy of social recognition and esteem. And this legitimates the lavish rewards that the market bestows on the winners, and the meager pay it offers many workers without a college degree. The financialization of the economy in the last four to five decades has reinforced this demoralizing message. As economic activity has shifted from making things to managing money, as society has heaped outsized rewards on hedge fund managers and Wall Street bankers, the esteem accorded work has become fragile and uncertain. At a time when finance has claimed a growing share of corporate profits, many who labor in the real economy, producing useful goods and services, have not only faced stagnant wages and uncertain job prospects, they have also come to feel that society accords less respect to the kind of work the working class does. This way of thinking about who deserves what is not morally defensible. But in recent decades especially, the idea that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good, this assumption has become deeply embedded. Meritocratic sorting helped entrench this idea. So did the market-driven version of globalization embraced by mainstream parties since the 1980s. These two outlooks, the meritocratic and the neoliberal, narrowed the grounds for resisting or contending with inequality. They undermined the dignity of work, fueling resentment against elites and prompting political backlash. How could higher education help us rethink these attitudes towards success and this way of conceiving what counts as a valuable contribution? Any attempt to honor work must begin by taking seriously the various forms of learning and training that prepare people to undertake work. This means reversing the retreat from public higher education. It means overcoming the neglect of technical and vocational education, breaking down the sharp distinction in funding and also in prestige between four-year colleges and other post-secondary educational settings. And this means thinking about dismantling the steep hierarchy of esteem that accords greater honor and prestige to students enrolled in name brand colleges and universities than to those in community colleges or in technical and vocational training programs. Learning to become a plumber or an electrician or a dental hygienist should be respected as a valuable contribution to the common good, not regarded as a consolation prize for, for those who lack the SAT scores or financial means to make it to a fancy college or university. Now, higher education Come back to the question of academic mission. Higher education derives much of its prestige from its avowedly higher purpose. Not only to equip students for the world of work, but also to prepare them to be morally reflective human beings and effective democratic citizens, capable of deliberating about the common good. I'm all for this. 
I certainly believe in the importance of moral and civic education. But why should we assume that colleges and universities have or should have a monopoly on this mission? A more capacious notion of educating citizens for democracy would resist the sequestration of civic education in universities for a couple of reasons. First, elite colleges and universities aren't doing very well at this task. <laughs> for the most part, our leading colleges and universities today seem to be better at inculcating technocratic skills and orientations than teaching the ability to reason and deliberate about fundamental moral and civic questions. And this technocratic emphasis may have contributed to the failure of governing elites over the past two generations, and may also have something to do with the impoverished terms of public discourse. But even if I'm my judgment about how they're performing this role, is, is too harsh. Some of you may think so. There's no reason why four-year colleges should be the sole setting for courses in moral reasoning and civic argument. Civic education out of doors, beyond the campus, so to speak, has a long tradition. One inspiring example is a demand made by the Knights of Labor one of America's first major labor unions, a demand for reading rooms in factories so that workers could inform themselves about public affairs. This demand grew out of a civic Republican tradition that viewed civic learning as embedded in the world of work. The cultural historian Christopher Lash pointed out that the egalitarian character of American society in the 19th century was less about social mobility than about the general diffusion of intelligence and learning across all classes and vocations. This is the kind of equality, this broad democratic equality of condition, that meritocratic sorting destroys. Because the sorting project, the sorting machine, seeks to concentrate intelligence and learning in the citadel of higher education. And then it offers a meritocratic tournament the, and we argue about what counts as a fair competition for access to that citadel. But this way of allocating access to learning undermines the dignity of work and it corrupts the common good. Civic education can flourish in community colleges, job training sites, and union halls, as well as on ivy-strewn campuses. There's no reason to suppose that aspiring nurses and plumbers are less suited to the art of democratic argument than aspiring management consultants. Now, I've spoken critically about the conversion of higher education into a sorting machine for a meritocratic society. And I've criticized as an inadequate response to inequality the rhetoric of rising, the political project that says the way to deal with inequality is to remove barriers to achievement so that everyone can enter the meritocratic tournament on fair terms, on a level playing field. It's certainly true that equality of opportunity is an important principle of justice. But it's important also to remember that equality of opportunity is a remedial principle. It's a corrective to injustice, but it's not by itself an adequate ideal for a just society. 
For that, we need a broader conception of equality, what I've described as a broad democratic equality of condition. This is not what some people attack as equality of results, where everyone must have the same income and wealth, however that could be achieved. A broad democratic equality of condition tries to create a social and civic life in which people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, encounter one another, bump up against one another in the course of their everyday lives. Because this is how we learn to negotiate and to abide our differences. And this is how we come to care for the common good. The American dream, some might see my critique of meritocracy as a critique of the American dream. Not really. I went back to the source, James Truslow Adams. He coined the term, the American dream, in the 1930s. And for him, it was partly about, uh, partly about mobility, the chance to rise. But it wasn't only about moving up. It was also, for him, about achieving a broad democratic equality of condition. And he gave a concrete example of what he meant. He pointed to the US Library of Congress, a symbol of what democracy can accomplish on its own behalf, a place of public learning that drew Americans from all walks of life. Here's what he wrote about it. As one looks down on the general reading room, which alone contains 10,000 volumes, which may be read without even the asking, one sees the seats filled with silent readers, old and young, rich and poor, black and white, the executive and the laborer, the general and the private, the noted scholar and the schoolboy, all reading at their own library provided by their own democracy. Adams considered this scene to be the perfect, the perfect working out in a concrete example of the American dream. The means provided by the resources of the people themselves and a public intelligent enough to use them. And he concluded, if this example could be carried out in all departments of our national life, the American dream would become an abiding reality. I think that more capacious conception of the American dream, the one that James Treslow Adams articulated, comes closer to gestures toward the public ethic, the public philosophy that we need today to heal or to attempt to heal the conversion of higher education into a sorting machine and to heal or to a attempt to heal the harsh attitudes towards success that drive us apart and that have inflicted a deep polarization on our politics that prevent us from aspiring to the common good. Thank you all very much. Now, Thank you. Now, Bill tells me we have time for questions, comments, objections. And not everybody may agree with uh, everything I've said. So the floor is open for, and I think we have microphones for anyone who would like to make a point. Yes, toward the back. Someone sitting toward the back has a hand up. And maybe if you could uh, stand, if you're able, sure. and, yeah. and introduce yourself. I'm Anne McLear. I work at SEIU Local 500 in Maryland. We've been organizing contingent faculty 
uh, graduate student staff now in campuses for 20 years. Um, so my question is, what, so these um, sorting houses of meritocracy that you're talking about, they in themselves are a microcosm of that very capital system, right? We have university presidents earning 10, 20, 100 times more than the lowest paid worker on campus. The very people you're talking about, right, uh, the workers without a college degree, are working on our campuses, enabling students yeah. to get a college degree, right? Yeah. So it seems to me that the campus is both like a locus of what you're talking about, and but also a place where, um, you know, everybody knows I'm a big utopianist, where we could address the very inequality problems right there. So my question for you is, what responsibility do the board of trustees, the presidents, the people that control the resources in universities and colleges, what responsibility do they have to redistribute those resources so that everybody on campus um, gets a fair shot and a living wage, et cetera? Thank you for that. I think there is a responsibility for those who govern higher education, colleges and universities, to to address the inequalities that I described and that you've uh, located on the campuses themselves. But I think the argument to be made to those who govern and those who have this responsibility should not only be an argument about redistribution and fairness, important though that argument is, it should also be, we need also to try to persuade them that the academic mission itself suffers when there is such a sharp division in the society and on campus uh, between those who perform different roles and different work. Sidney Hook worried that there was a tension between collective bargaining on the one hand and the academic mission on the other. I see it somewhat differently because I think the academic mission itself has been distorted and corrupted over the past four or five decades as higher education has been conscripted into becoming a sorting machine because what, what worries me as, a, as an educator, as a teacher about our institutions is that the credentializing f function of higher education is beginning to crowd out the educational function. So much of what wins a place in the ranking of the US News and World Report, which is itself, I think, has a, exerts a corrupting influence, is a hierarchy of prestige that, has, that uh, induces colleges and universities to really divert themselves from teaching and learning which is at the heart of the academic mission, and also civic education, toward a kind of prestige mongering, trying to boost the average SAT score for the sake of the rankings and so on. This isn't good for the academic mission itself. This isn't good, it's enhanced in a way the, the economic and political and cultural power and prestige of higher education, but it's come at a cost, and the cost is, I think, distracting us from our fundamental mission, teaching and learning, and also civic education. Thank you for that question. Who else? Can, can I go? Um, my name is Donald Cohen, I'm over here. Yeah. You're looking in the wrong direction. There okay, you go. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I see you there now. Yeah. I'm the executive director of a group called In the Public Interest. I wonder if you could reflect on the relationship or what you're talking about now, the, the, the meritocracy, and the increasing commodification 
of, of yes. public things, not just higher education, right. from public things that were publicly provided and to, you know, to commodities, and higher ed is, a, is a, you know, a clear example of that. Yes. I think there is a close connection between the two. I think we're witnessing the, uh, during these decades the corporatization of colleges and universities and the commodification of higher education. President Rapp mentioned that I've, uh, you know, I've traveled in various places, including in East Asia, and some years ago, I wrote a book on the commodification of everything called What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. And I was, I was giving a talk in uh, East Asia, and I was giving the, the students a hypothetical about them to test the moral limits of markets. And I said, suppose that a college or university, in order to increase its revenues, decided to sell a certain number of seats in the first year class. Would, would you be for that or against it? And we had a discussion about it, and one of the students said, well, I know that's what you do in the United States, but, and then they went on to make their point, and I, and I uh, quickly, but naively, said, well, I corrected them, maybe implicitly because of legacy, advantages, and so on, but there, there's not the outright sale. Then later I came and learned, and we learned to some degree from the recent court case uh, about a affirmative action where documents were released about the emissions process, that it isn't, some of these places not only give donor legacy advantages, but some do give advantages to applicants of children of donors who may not be uh, alumni and have no connection other than the money. So what the, uh, so my, my corrective, my earnest corrective, actually now I learned was not the case. So I think it is a general problem, the commodification of areas of social life beyond the realm of cars and toasters, the kinds of things that money and markets properly allocate, is a part of the, uh, a, a part of the condition that, that I've been describing. So to, to rein in the harsh attitudes towards success, the role of universities and colleges as sorting machines, we also have to uh, rein in the tendency to, um, uh, to allow money and markets to govern, uh, to govern the realm of education, as well as uh, to, to colonize other aspects of social life. Thank you for that. Who else? Uh. Thank you for oh, your yeah, go ahead. enlightening presentation. My name is David Vitoff. I'm a longtime organizer for the Illinois affiliate of the NEA, and I've had the pleasure of organizing many different bargaining units of higher ed employees, all different classifications. <clears throat> Expanding on your metaphor of the, of the publicly uh, funded reading room, the Library of Congress, yeah. um, I equate in that same metaphor tuition um, a free tuition for community colleges and student debt uh, relief, uh, or forgiveness, I should say. And I'm wondering, beyond the usual suspects of those who oppose those, do you have an idea of who are the most uh, nefarious, if I may say, opponents to those concepts, and are they well organized? Well, you would know better than I would how well organized they are. I think free community college is uh, very much in the spirit of the reading rooms in the factories. But your question raises, I think, a larger point about um, union organizing and collective bargaining in education. 
And that's related to the, what the Knights of Labor were trying to do. Unlike many uh, subsequent unions, the Knights of Labor, they negotiated about hours and pay, the material interests of workers. But their vision went beyond that, and their mission and purpose went beyond that, in ways that actually expressed a view about the common good. In the case of the reading rooms, cultivating well-informed democratic citizens. In the case of higher education, some of the demands of unions uh, in higher education involve the material support, the pay, for example, of the pay and job security of teachers who lack, uh, lack adequate pay and job security. But other issues can and should be defended in the name of a broader conception of the good of education. For example, in many organizing campaigns of, of graduate student teaching assistants, among the demands um, are smaller section sizes or class sizes, which is not just a way of doing less work, it's a way of providing better education for students. And I think the more we can uh, frame the, the mission and purpose of collective bargaining in education in the name of improving education, the less it will be seen as standing in tension with the academic mission. That's over here, that's given, and we're just trying to get more money for the graduate student teaching assistants. No, the argument is if the uh, adjunct teachers and contingent teachers and, the, and graduate student teachers are paid better and are re respected uh, in a deeper way. And if class sizes are smaller. And if community college is free to everyone. This goes beyond the politics of self-interest. It touches the politics of the common good. And I think it's an important feature of collective bargaining in higher education that it touch the common good, that it speak to the academic mission, so that it's not seen as a rival to it. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Who else? Uh, Carl Levine, I'm a labor side labor attorney who has represented faculty unions at all levels for the last 25 years or so. Uh, Thank you for your talk, and I hear in what you're saying a critique of the idea of meritocracy, not only its inadequacy, but what I consider to be the myth of the meritocracy. And one yes. area in which uh, this has been discussed extensively recently is the issue of affirmative action. And to me, um, I'm very reluctant to cede the merit-based argument to affirmative action. When I look at affirmative action, I'm much more comfortable arguing about what has somebody achieved in terms of their level on GPA and college admissions exams as measured against the resources they were given and where they started. So that somebody who achieves maybe somewhat lower on their SATs may in fact be showing much greater merit given what they started with to achieve that level. So given its uh, place right now before the Supreme Court and in the common discourse, uh, I'd like it if you could say a few words about your view on affirmative action and the merit-based uh, support for it. Thank you. Yes, well, you, uh, I agree with you that um, support for affirmative action does not depend on rejecting merit. Many of the arguments for affirmative action criteria in admissions, uh, for that matter, in hiring, can be in the name of a broader conception of what counts as merit. 
um, and what counts as academic promise and what counts as a contribution to the common good. So I think it's a mistake to define the debate over affirmative action. It's a debate between those who believe in merit, as if grades and test scores alone somehow measured merit, and those who, want, who care about other values. I think that's a false description of what's at stake. And so I do think we need more expansive and contestable conceptions of what merit is um, in addressing the affirmative action debate. Bill Herbert tells me that um, it's time to bring this to a close, so I wonder if I could just make a final comment building on the, la the questions that people have raised. We found ourselves, we, we, we started with collective bargaining in higher education. That's what brings us together. But we find ourselves thinking through together fundamental questions about merit, about the common good, about the mission and purpose of higher education. And, and meritocracy. At the heart of what makes merit, can make merit, narrowly conceived, a kind of tyranny, is the tendency of a market-driven meritocratic project to encourage us to believe that our success is our own doing, to forget the luck and good fortune that help us on our way, to forget our indebtedness to those who make our achievements possible. This forgetfulness conduces to a certain kind of hubris. On the other hand, reminding ourselves of the role of luck and contingency in whatever success we've achieved, that can prompt a certain humility. The idea there, but for the accident of fate or fortune, the accident of birth, go I. That could be me. Reminding ourselves of the role of luck and contingency and indebtedness in our achievements could point us away from the harsh ethic of success that drives us apart and could point us toward, or so I hope, a more generous, less rancorous public life. Thank you for the work that you do and for your questions today. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Professor Sandel, uh, for great, uh, and ex um, informative, and, and ex inspiring comments and um, presentation. Um, so I want to just go through a couple of logistics right now. Present, uh, Pro uh, Professor Sandel is going to be available to sign books outside of the in the lobby, um, and that he'll be starting that shortly. Um, at 11 o'clock, we will have three breakout sessions. The first one will be held here on Title IX, and it will be uh, starting at 11. Uh, then we have two pan other panels uh, across the street. One is on uh, uh, state funding for higher education, financing over the past half century, as well as uh, one panel on the 50th, uh, history, 50 year history of collective bargaining at Hofstra University. It's all tied with our, our theme of uh, the celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Center. So I thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to uh, you coming back. And again, Professor Seidenel will be signing books shortly. Thanks again.